I would like to share with you some reflections about the following question. What can we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic? COVID-19 has involved numerous challenges for public health and food safety in numerous countries. To understand these challenges, let us look at the fields of public health and food safety from a legal and social perspective. Law is embedded in society. We need to take a broad view of law in its social context, ranging from international treaties to national legislation, administrative regulations, and detailed technical standards. Then we can draw some preliminary lessons from COVID-19. My talk is divided into three parts. In the first part, I show that public health and food safety are closely re related. Public health and food safety have much to learn from each other. In the second part, I discuss in more detail the basic features of global food safety law. This discussion will provide a foundation for the third part, which identifies six key lessons we can learn from COVID-19. First part, public health and food safety are closely related. Public health includes food security, food safety, and food quality. Is there enough food? Is the food safe to eat? Is the food nutritious? Let me give three examples of this interaction. The most well-known example of the close relation between food safety and public health is the 2008 melamine baby formula scandal. To meet standards for protein content in milk and increase their own profits, unscrupulous individuals, milk collection stations, and some milk processors added milk, melamine to milk in China between 2005 and 2008. Melamine is a tasteless and odorless white crystalline powder, which is very rich in nitrogen. It is used in industrial products, such as kitchen countertops, white erase boards, and fire retardant fabrics. Consuming it in milk or other products can lead to serious kidney problems, even kidney failure. Starting about 2008, it caused severe health problems in 46 countries, including China, where about 300,000 children became ill and six infants died. This amounted to intentional or unintentional harm to public health. It stimulated the enactment of China's first real food safety law, the Food Safety Law of 2009. A second example concerns the ways in which COVID-19 has disrupted food supply chains and labor relations in agriculture around the world. The combination of consumer hoarding, disruption to transport in supply chains, and the lack, lack of migrant workers is threatening food production and distribution. For an instance, the United States depends substantially on foreign countries for seafood. More than 60% of seafood consumed in the United States is reported to be produced in other countries, including China. 
The pandemic has also affected agricultural production. American and European farmers are having difficulties in recruiting seasonal agricultural workers. For instance, Germany normally employs about 30,000 workers for the asparagus harvest. So far, however, few have arrived. Some workers cannot enter foreign countries or they do not want to go to for, through 14 days quarantine when they return home. The same difficulties in recruiting seasonal workers are occurring in France for the strawberry season and in the Netherlands for tomatoes and cucumbers. In parts of the world, and this is my third example, the COVID-19 pandemic has also led to problems of food security, increased inequality of food distribution, undernourishment, and increased poverty. Food security and public health can be competitors. Recently, the New York Times reported that refugee camps in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, for example, Bangladesh, suffer increasingly from lack of food and basic health conditions. Food, water, and soap are often lacking. People cannot wash their kids, let alone wash their hands. There is little, if any, testing, and there are few health facilities and much overcrowding. Creating social distance is virtually impossible in Gaza or the urban slums of Indonesia and India. A Syrian refugee in Beirut, Lebanon, was quoted as saying, instead of buying masks, it is better to buy food for my children. We're not going to die from corona, but from food shortage. All these examples are transnational. The melamine baby formula crisis was not a purely domestic event. It involved the intersection of three overlapping social fields, the world of multinational companies and international comp competition, the world of domestic economy, industrial structure and society, and the world of government, law and regulation. We could make a similar analysis of the effects of COVID-19 on food supply chains, agricultural production, or food security. Food safety and public health are closely related in many parts of the world. As we often hear, pandemics do not respect borders. They tend to increase inequality in access to food as well as access to public health services. These examples show that the social fields of public health and food safety share many basic features. Government is responsible for both, but both also involve the whole society. In both fields, we can identify a set of basic principles. Moreover, when ordinary citizens or specialists think about public health or about food safety, they use unconsciously or consciously ways of analyzing risks. Moreover, they also use standards. These features are common to food safety and public health. I analyze them in a few minutes by looking at the basic features of global food safety law. Now I come to the second part of my talk. Against this general background, I look more closely at global food safety law. I will point to some of its basic features. Using this method, we can extrapolate by imagination to the field of public health in order to draw lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. 
First, global food safety law has what we can call a global normative repertoire. I use this expression by analogy to musicians or theater companies, which typically have a repertoire of music or plays from which they select elements for a specific performance. In the legal field, we can define this repertoire as a handful of basic concepts, principles, and rules involving the constitution of a conceptual and normative repertoire. Drawing on international or transnational law, multilateral negotiations, national legislation, administrative regulations, soft law, and administrative or judicial decisions in several jurisdictions within a specific historical context. Elements of the global repertoire are sometimes implemented directly or indirectly into a national legal system. Examples are food safety law, anti-dumping law in international trade, competition law, or regulation of toxic pesticides. Second feature is governmental responsibility. In most countries, the national government has the major responsibility for ensuring our food safety. Since the late 19th century, most people feel that their government should take the main responsibility for organizing a food safety system. This is not true worldwide, but it seems to apply to most countries. A third feature is that global food safety law focuses on the whole supply chain. Increasingly, this is part of national food safety systems. It goes under the name of traceability. It is frequently called regulation from farm to fork or from farm to chopsticks. An example is the use of hazard analysis critical control point, HACCP, which seeks to regulate food safety at the riskiest points in the food chain instead of relying on regulation after the product is on the market. A fourth key feature is standards. Standards transform general goals such as food safety into specific detailed technical requirements for processes or products. Internationally, they are made, for example, by the Codex Alimentarius Commission for Food Safety, the International Telecommunications Union, ITU for telecoms, the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, ISO, for business or environmental standards, or other organizations. However, standards are a double-edged sword. They are designed to protect the public interest, but they also serve as barriers to market access. This is true whether the standards are legally binding or whether they are soft law, for example, recommendations. In the past, many scholars studied the development of international standards as being a form of top-down or command and control regulation. Today, however, many scholars, including me, use theories of regulatory intermediation. These theories focus on relations between a regulator an intermediary and a regulatory target, RIT, which involves three group, different groups of actors, 
instead of only two. In the field of food quality, the regulator is usually assumed to be an international organization. For example, according to the World Trade Organization WTO agreements, the Codex Alimentarius Commission in Rome is the principal source of international food safety standards. Codex standards are proposed by committees composed of national de government delegations, which tend to be dominated, research shows, by international food manufacturers and agrochemical corporations. In principle, Codex standards are not legally binding. In practice, however, they were given legal effect by the WTO appellate body decision in the beef hormones case, which the United States and Canada brought against the European Union. Here I would like to draw on my own research. I have studied food safety and food quality, for example, green food and organic food in China. Codex now has highly developed standards for organic food. The striking fact about this economic sector, however, is that international standards stem essentially from an international non-governmental network known as the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, IFOAM, IFOAM. In formulating and developing standards for organic products, IFOAM and the Codex represent a kind of governance partnership, a formal or informal arrangement between a founder partner and one or more frequently transnational actors which have common goals but remain organizationally independent and they decide to share in the exercise of regulatory authority over a common set of target actors or issues. In this field of organic food, IFOAM is the rule maker endowed with discursive power because of its expertise, its standing in the field, and its established network. Codex plays a supporting role, which nevertheless is essential because of its position as a legitimate, internationally accepted standard setter under WTO public international law. For organic food, we might say that IFOAM is the new global ruler, and that's a quotation. Such partnerships exist in virtually every area of global governance. Usually they are invisible. Nevertheless, they contribute to the development of private transnational standards and to the privatization of global regulation. As other research has shown, for global retailing and building regulation. A fifth feature of global food safety law is risk analysis. All living creatures have always had many ways of analyzing risks. However, risk analysis as we know it today began in the insurance industry in the early 19th century. Contemporary risk analysis usually has three components. I would like to deal with these briefly. The first component of risk analysis is called risk assessment. This refers to the use of scientific expertise to evaluate the likelihood that a potential risk will really come about. Second feature of global food safety law risk analysis is risk management. How should we deal with risks? In food safety, 
This is usually the responsibility of governments through law. For example, prohibition on trade in food that is thought to be unsafe. Here many governments invoke the precautionary principle. This is a decision rule, meaning stop and think. It does not necessarily require any particular policy, such as banning the food in question, but it does require the decision maker to consider various options, such as putting a label on a food product to identify the contents. An example is European Union food safety law, which I look at in a few minutes. The third component of, global, of contemporary risk analysis is risk communication. Who to tell what? to whom and when. This is a difficult, complex, and sensitive issue, which now will certainly be given more consideration throughout the world. During the current pandemic, in the field of public health, different governments, traditional media, and social media have given many different answers to these questions who should tell what to whom and when. Some of these answers are based on careful scientific assessments of the origins of the virus, the trajectory of the pandemic, demands on hospitals and medical staff, availability of equipment, balance of likely social and economic consequences, and many other factors. But other answers are simply fake news at least in Europe and elsewhere, it is not always easy for the citizen to distinguish between these different versions. To return briefly to risk management and the precautionary principle, I'll give the example of the European Union food safety law. In this law, the precautionary principle means, and I quote, in specific circumstances where following an assessment of available information, the possibility of harmful effects on health is identified, but scientific uncertainty persists. Provisional risk management measures necessary to ensure the high level of health protection chosen in the European community may be adopted, and here I emphasize may. Pending further scientific information for a more comprehensive risk assessment and taking account of technical and economic feasibility and other factors regarded as legitimate in the matter under consideration. You can see that the decision maker may take account not only of scientific opinion, but also of technical and economic feasibility, and also of other factors regarded as legitimate, for example, public opinion. Based on this brief socio-legal excursus in the fields of public health and food safety, we can draw six lessons from the COVID-19 experience so far. Lesson one, be prepared for the next calamity. COVID-19 is not the first, first pandemic or major worldwide emergency, nor will it be the last. We must be prepared for the next one. We need to learn as much as possible from the current pandemic from many perspectives. Some examples, some questions. Which basic principles in managing the pandemic are useful and which are not? Do countries have adequate public health systems? Or if not, can they get quick, quick access 
to infrastructure, staff, and medicines? To what extent do countries cooperate with each other? And if they do not cooperate, why not? Figuring out why countries do not cooperate may be very helpful in improving cooperation. How can cooperation be encouraged, channeled, and fostered? How have people in different situations coped with lockdown or confinement? How should we balance maintaining public health and ensuring economic activity? What about retirement homes for the elderly, which may pose serious risks of contagion in an enclosed community? What about people who intentionally ignore social distancing or stay at home guidelines or recommendations? Should a person who deliberately coughs on other people or sneezes on other people to transmit the virus be subject to a criminal sanction? What about the increased incidence of domestic violence against women during periods of lockdown? Most of these questions are not strictly legal questions, but they do raise a host of issues from the legal perspective as well as from other perspectives. Lesson two, the current ap ac epidemic has demonstrated that most if not all countries lack sufficient infrastructure, training, and education to deal with a serious worldwide crisis. This includes health and medical infrastructure and training in medical and health personnel. We desperately need more public education about public health. Do citizens really understand how public health systems work? Do our public health systems ensure equal treatment for all citizens? What about countries where access to public health is not or cannot be guaranteed? We also need more publicly shared research and information on possible health connections between wild animals and human beings. Universities, schools, me media, market participants, and all social organizations can play important roles. We need a special concentration on the intersections of law, medicine, and standards. Lesson three, dealing with risks. COVID-19 has revealed that different countries have different ways of dealing with risks at every stage of the process. The learning curve has been very steep, often with major health consequences. If we continue to use the paradigm of risk analysis, we need more worldwide cooperation and shared information on risk assessment, on risk management, and on risk communication. Governments are responsible for establishing workable reporting systems and also for ensuring that these systems function properly. However, the entire society should participate. Lesson four concerns regulation of food markets. The pandemic teaches us that it is necessary to control food markets more strictly. We need tighter constraints and better enforcement of regulation of markets for distribution of food and medical products, whether by law, administrative regulations and guidelines or other forms of soft law or basic rules of business practice and even public morals and sense of responsibility for others are extremely important components. Food markets should not deal in live animals and endangered species. 
the global trade in endangered species should be banned. It is a threat to public health, among many other reasons. The rules must be enforced. Law on the books is useless without law in action. Now I come to lesson five. Lesson five concerns risk communication. We need worldwide cooperation and understanding on risk communication. In our globalized but fragmented world, it is important to give special emphasis to this point. The pandemic teaches us the importance of appropriate transparency in the management and communication of public health crises. This is a difficult, complex, and sensitive issue, as I have already mentioned, which now will certainly be given more consideration throughout the world. Differences between countries and cultures are already clear and should be recognized, but cooperation with other countries, regions, and international organizations is essential. Now I come to lesson six, global standards. We need effective global standards about public health, especially risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication. The world requires more cooperation and shared standards. Ideally, these standards should be agreed voluntarily by consensus in relevant regional and international standard setting bodies. This is the classic practice of the World Health Organization and the International Organization for Standardization. However, some researchers argued that this practice is now out of date and in a more fragmented world, it does not work anymore. We need to imagine other ways to cooperate. For example, standards could be agreed and recommended even by a group of countries or by epistemic groups of specialists in the hope and objective that these standards would be adopted by more countries and groups. We need to enlist the power of new technology in this task. Standards for dealing with pandemics should go beyond WHO standards and ISO standards, for example, for ISO on occupational health or the environment. Thorough research is needed now to identify the organizations which should host these standards and also, of course, to determine the possible content of the standards. Now I come to the conclusion. Very briefly. China is and will continue to be a major participant in making international standards. China shares two of the most important committees of the Codex Alimentarius, for example. China will provide or help make thousands of new standards in the One Belt, One Road or Belt and Road Initiative. In the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, and many other standards bodies. China should now take the lead in the field of public health in proposing new standards, how to implement them, and how to foster international cooperation. That is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.